Welcome to another edition of CHP Talks. We are continuing our conversation on Bill C-10, and this time focusing on media bias with former CHP leader Ron Gray. And uh, Rod, why don't you again give a short introduction, and let's continue this conversation. Yes, for all. For those uh, who were not on our last broadcast, uh, you may wish to go back to it in the archives and you can learn more about Ron Gray's uh, glorious uh, lengthy history in journalism and politics and other related topics. Uh, but I just wanna say that Ron uh, was a leader of the Christian Heritage Party for 13 years, wonderful years for the party. And uh, we look up to him in many ways as a mentor. He's uh, an articulate spokesperson for uh, life, family, and freedom, and for the Christian Heritage Party, and uh, represented us well, and actually brought many of us to a place of serving in the party um, by his great example. So it's it's a pleasure to have Ron with us today. We always learn things that we didn't know when we talk with Ron. So uh, we thank you, Ron, for joining us today and and helping us break down this topic of uh, media bias. Thank you, Rod and Peter. It's good to see you both again. So as we said in the introduction, we're talking about media bias, but also mm -hmm. about Bill C-10, which we discussed in more length in, in the previous episode. And so I, I want to begin uh, this conversation with a question um, relating to media and relating to Bill C-10, and that's the question of, is the government uh, making a the old mistake of picking a fight uh, with Bill C-10, uh, picking a fight with those who buy ink by the barrel? And uh, <clears throat> I, I know I got that expression from you, Ron. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, and, I, and I learned it in the public relations business. Never pick a fight with someone who buys ink by the barrel. Uh, although today, uh, the shoe is kind of on the other foot. I, I don't know. You can't buy electrons by the barrel, but uh, <laughs> but electronic media have, have really begun to steal advertising revenue away from the legacy media. And that's made, that's made the legacy media very vulnerable. Uh, and vulnerable to anyone who might want to persuade them. And, and unfortunately, our prime minister has chosen to persuade them with nearly $600 million in a slush fund that, that he gives to trustworthy media, which seems to be only those that support liberal government. And so there is bias, but there has always been bias. Look, when I was a cub reporter um, and Jack Webster, the late great Jack Webster was my city editor. Jack used to tell us little greenhorns, he said, you can't ever be perfectly objective, but you should try. Your goal should be to be the eyes and ears of the reader of the newspaper and you report to them what you see and what you hear and let them make up their own mind. But somewhere back around the 70s, I suppose it was, the university journalism schools began to teach a different philosophy, which was you can't ever be perfectly objective, so be subjective. And the reporter then moved into center stage of the story. And it was, what do I feel? What do I think about what? And, and that was a real blow to journalistic impartiality. You know, there are some, there are some media, and, and I'm really grateful for them that are trying to adhere to the old standards. You know, Ezra Levant, uh, is is one of them with the rebel, and um, and a new one in the field uh, is the Epoch Times. I've taken out a su subscription to that. I'm astonished at uh, at two things. One is because I know that Epoch Times was begun by Chinese expatriates who wanted to expose the cruelty and oppression of the communist Chinese government. 
and they started it in New York, but they have a Canadian edition now and they've got Canadian reporters in the major cities all across Canada. Uh, and they really do a remarkably good job of objective reporting. I trust them more than almost any of the legacy media now, certainly more than the CBC, which, which is so directly on the government payroll that, that you know, Ezra Levant refers to it as, as the state media of Canada. Mm, yeah. Well, well, it's hard to actually argue otherwise in an objective sense. I mean, what is a state media? It's a, it's a, a media funded by the state, and that's what we have, right? So. That's it, a, a billion and a half dollars a year that our government pays for a propaganda arm that usually, not invariably, but usually presents the government's talking points on almost any story. Once in a while, they have been critical, but not often enough, not often enough to be regarded as good objective reporters. You have to, you have to build up your own screen of filters to take out the, the bot stories and, and start and try to pee. And, and they're very artful at it. I mean, these guys are skillful. They, they know how not only to tailor the words, but even the pictures that accompany a television report can change your perception of what is being said. That's what the business of advertising is about. That's why advertisers pay really big bucks to get uh, uh, 30 seconds of your time on television. They do the same thing and somebody is paying the bills with the news stories. I've often wondered how uh, an organization like the CBC uh, got to where it is today, because I think if you go back to World War II, uh, they were much more uh, centrist. And of course, we've had, you know, the education system, uh, university system, uh, you know, the media itself, like the, the medium of uh, television and so on, has led to different uh, types of uh, ways of looking at the world. But the, the media, certainly CBC particularly, but many other uh, branches of the media have slid in a leftward direction, uh, you know, using right and left in a in broad sense, uh, more towards socialism, uh, uh, away from a biblical worldview that we endorse. And of course, we in the Christian Heritage Party, and I think the pro-life movement in general, other, other uh you know, uh, family-oriented organizations have felt not only the uh, the fangs of uh, of the uh, left-leaning, you know, bias, but also sometimes uh, damage is done just by ignoring truth. Uh, you know, we've had our our uh, pro-life marches either totally ignored, not even mentioned, or or certainly numbers, uh, you know, uh, underreported, and so on. So it's not always direct uh, attacks, but I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Saskatoon and there was a young reporter there, a couple of them actually from different organizations. And I thought the questions were good. Uh, the, uh, I, I enjoyed the uh, interview. I thought it went well. And when I read the article, I couldn't believe it. It had turned into a hit piece on, on the CHP. Um, every time he quoted me, uh, he came back, uh, followed that up with a uh, denial of what I was saying was true, uh, you know, some kind of an attack on my, you know, pro-life uh, inferences and so on. And I, I, I was in contact with him after and I said, you know, that wasn't really reporting. That was uh, an opinion piece. And uh, he, he couldn't see it. Uh, like we just finally had to agree to disagree. He, he thought he had done a good job of reporting on what I said. Uh, but the article was a complete uh, focus on what was wrong with what I said. Well, I, I had a similar example, uh, and this is about two decades back, that I attended a, a rally. It was pro-life and pro-family uh, on some issues that were coming before the court. So it was down at the Vancouver courthouse. 
And the streets were absolutely full of people supporting uh, uh, the pro-life and pro-family point of view, largely Chinese Canadians, by the way. I, I, it, was, it was the Chinese church that turned out to this thing in enormous numbers. Um, there were at least 3,000 people there. One estimate said that there may have been 10 or even 20,000 in the streets. I mean, the streets were just blocked. There was a small cadre of um, homosexual activists who appeared on one corner and the police put up some barricades to keep them on one side and us on the other, which was a move to ensure public peace, I guess, and safety. Although we were certainly not threatening anyone. But about, I, um, I think it was 13 people from the pro-gay organization turned up. The news reports the next day focused entirely on interviews with that 13 people. Hmm. And, you know, if that is not biased reporting, then nothing is. But I look, I have to confess, when I was a young reporter, there were times when I ang angled a story to suit my the mood of my this is why Jack used to lecture us from time to time. I do remember one, one story. I was working at the New Westminster Bureau of the Vancouver Sun. And there was a, a group of investors who were opening, they were going to open a new hotel. And the Vancouver province at that time was a morning paper and the Sun was the evening paper. And these guys staged the announcement of their hotel, the approval of the plans and all the funding was in place and everything. And they, they staged it just after our deadline for the evening paper. So the competition beat us because they had the story the next morning. So I went looking for another angle and I phoned all the churches in the neighborhood and said, what do you feel about having a beer parlor opening up in, in your neighborhood? <laughs> I, I, I plead guilty. I slanted the story, you know. That, that. Now, they survived. It didn't, it didn't destroy that hotel. They survived and they thrived. But that was just an example of how a reporter can bias a story. I had an example soon after I became the leader of the Christian Heritage Party, and I moved to Hull, Quebec. It's now called um, Gatineau. They, they amalgamated several communities and called it by the name Gatineau. But I moved to Hull, Quebec, just across the river from Ottawa, so that I would have a residence in Quebec where I could immerse myself in the language and learn French and be, you know, within driving distances of parliament in order to make contact with parliamentarians. So we announced the fact that I was moving to Quebec and, and that I was going to be in the capital region. And we offered an interview and only one paper accepted the idea of doing an interview with this party leader moving into the capital region. That was the Ottawa citizen. So we arranged to meet at a downtown Ottawa restaurant, kind of in the outdoor area. And I got there early because I hate to be late and you don't want to you don't want to stand up a reporter who has actually agreed to interview. So there I, I was having my cup of coffee and reading, as it happened that day, The Economist magazine, because I just like to stay in touch with international finance and things. So the reporter came over and he looked at me and he looked at the magazine and he said, I didn't expect to see you reading that. <laughs> I had an indication of what he was bringing to the interview right there. But at least, at least that 
the citizen did send a reporter to do the interview. Mm -hmm. I also had newspapers that played with my name. The most common headline when I toured around and, and made speeches was, Gray sees it in black and white. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, that's an easy pun to put in your headline. But the fact is that God sees it in black and white. <laughs> you know, and I'm just trying the best I can to use his perspective in analyzing what goes on in our country, because the scripture tells us that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. So, you know, it, it's just we want to put that perspective into. But the 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 bias of the newspapers is there. It is, and it probably always will be there. I, one of the reasons I like the Epoch Times is that they have not necessarily a Christian but a spiritual worldview because of their relationship to the Falun Gong movement. Um, Falun Gong is, is kind of Eastern mysticism. It's somewhat related to yoga in ways. And, and there are problems with that as well. But as far as I have read from their stories, it plays out in family and social values that are very, very close to Christian values. At least it, it, it comes out fair and, and balanced more than most of the legacy media do. I, you know, we are so we, and I mean, I'm talking now about CHP, we are so misunderstood before the interview even begins. You know, I, when I ran as a candidate in the, for the provincial CHP here in, in British Columbia, here in my home city of Abbotsford, the local newspaper did a series of interviews with all of the candidates. And their first question to me was, Abbotsford is now about 50% Sikh. How would you as a Christian be able to represent that portion of the population? I wanted to reply to that by saying, do you ask that question of Sikh candidates? But they don't, uh, they would never do that. Uh, a Sikh candidate in the media can do no wrong. They cannot have any bias. That's simply the perception that the reporters bring to it, but they assume that we come with a bias. But a worldview is not necessarily a biased view if it is rooted in immutable universal standards. Mm -hmm. The Ten Commandments are not unique to Christianity or to Judaism, only in the sense that those are the, the two faiths that have held these standards up and said, these will give us a good society. But many, many, many people of other faiths or even of no faith look at the Decalogue and say, those are good ideas. You know, murder is not nice. Yeah. Uh, adultery is not not good for social cohesion. Um, theft is, is not a good economic basis to run your society on. I mean, so the only reason those are ours is because we got them from an unimpeachable source. God gave those 
standards to us. We didn't invent them, but th that's what we offer to the public. Yeah. Well, that's but, what I was, Ron, I was asked that question media. in a public, yeah. in a public debate in uh, Northern BC here in the Bulkley Valley. I was asked that question. Uh, how are you as a Christian going to represent uh, all the people of your writing? And uh, so I, I basically just said, you know, uh, well, uh, we put forward policies like don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, uh, don't commit adultery, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. How is that not good for everybody, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's basically what, what you're saying, too, is that we have policies that would be good for everybody. And uh, certainly you brought forward a good point on the other side is uh, they don't ask uh, the other people how you're going to represent Christians, right, in your community. No. So there, so there is the bias. And we've, and we've struggled against that all along uh, because reporters usually come to us to an interview if they are going to do an interview. I mean, you know, look... At, at the convention where I first won the leadership of the party, I held out an olive branch to the media. I said, look, I, you know, I used to work in the media. I know that you're always looking for a new angle on a story. We have a different angle on the story. I, I'd be happy to share that with you. The problem was there were no reporters at all at that convention. The media didn't think it was worth covering. And yet, this is a party that was, you know, the fifth largest of the 18 or so federal political parties. Yeah. But they didn't think that we were worth covering because they presumed that we had a bias. There's a, there's a faulty assumption that the CHP has always had to work against and it still is true today. Many people misunderstand. They think that we want to win the power of government and use the power of government to make other people believe what we believe. That is not CHP's goal. Our purpose, our goal, is to say to our neighbors, would you like to be governed by a party that believes that the word of God is the best guide for social peace and cohesion? We make that offer. And what they decide is up to them. But if nobody ever makes the offer, then the, auto the automatic answer is no. But... I still believe that a majority of Canadians actually, if, if they set everything aside that they read in the news, that they see on television, if, if they just address that question, would you like to be governed according to the principles like the Ten Commandments? I think most Canadians would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we keep making the offer because that's our job. Our job is to make sure that that offer doesn't disappear from the list of options available to the Canadian public. Wow. Well, that's a great place perhaps to, to uh, wrap this up, except to say um, thank you so much, Ron, for your insights on these things. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a good um, a, a good thoughtful conversation and I hope everyone who uh, listens perhaps you're a newer member of CHP or just a supporter and you weren't privileged to have heard many speeches that Ron gave over the years as I was as a uh, young uh, impressionable teenager and in my early 20s um, was able to learn so much from Ron during those years that has served me so well since in politics and other parts of life so thank you Ron again for your contributions and your ongoing passion for CHP it is infectious. Listen, it's been great being with you guys again. There's just one thing that I want to say to you and to the audience. I pray for CHP every day, and I hope that they will do the same. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so thank much, you. Ron. And uh, just before we close, swinging in a wide circle back to C10, which is the uh, threat that kind of uh, started this conversation off uh, in the last two segments. Um, we just want people to reach out uh, to their member of parliament and let them know that they are not comfortable and they're not going to accept the idea that the government in power can control the internet so that only their message gets through. We, we think our message uh, is often ignored and uh, to the detriment of our country, but to have our message actually uh, squelched, to have our voice censored, uh, the internet would just be the first place where that would happen, then it would follow in, in other venues and ultimately yeah. in the political process. The party in power must allow full and frank discussion of all the issues or we are headed into a dictatorship. So I don't mean to end on a sour note, but just want to, to remind folks that there is a, a clear and present danger to our freedom as citizens to communicate uh, good and important ideas with one another. So uh, reach out and let your member of parliament know that we won't have it. We, <laughs> we want freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom to communicate good news to our neighbors. So uh, thank you very much. And maybe one other note of encouragement in terms of the media bias thing, um, maybe give a little note of encouragement to a reporter who is doing a good job uh, it's got to be tougher for them these days too so uh, end that on a positive note and thank you again Ron and Rod for this conversation and thank you all for listening and we hope that you'll join us again next time for another edition of CHB Talks thank you all